Giving a big 10-4 to his good buddies on the Canadian Freedom Convoy. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The church is going to mandate you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. Nega, I assume. Come on. Snubbed. Well, we were. Uh, Ruth. We'll get into uh, a lot of uh, the Oscar picks and the buzz and all that. Uh, things to catch you guys up on. Uh, my phone is not working. How uh, would you know? I was going to say. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I've learned some valuable lessons. Um, so I went for a very long sea kayak ride yesterday. Nice. I went. From, well, if people know Malibu, somewhere around Duke's, it's a mm-hmm. bad restaurant mm-hmm. called Duke's. Is it there. bad? I've never been there. It's, I know uh, it's legendary. It's, it's like, it's tourist food. Yes. Uh-huh. Is, is what it is. I believe last time I was there, one of the offerings was like a bowl of soup with a submerged grilled cheese like <laughs> inside the bowl. What are we doing here? Yeah, I'm not totally sure. They also do their calamari which is instead of the curly cues, mm-hmm. they do the big, long, meaty strips, strips. of it, which are no. chewy and no. weird. And don't I abide don't, by that. I don't go for that kind of calamari, but any. can do. Uh, I went about, I guess it'd be about two miles. I went to the pier. I went to the Malibu Pier, went sort of past the pier, turned around, and uh, got to the pier and then uh, went back. It was glassy, it was mm. beautiful, it was clear. Yeah. I had this uh, I had this weird realization when I was paddling through Malibu. I thought, I pay a shitload in taxes, and then I go, I feel like I'm using them now. Good. Yeah. Like, I'm not, you know, the, I can't use the park. It's got a bunch of illegals playing soccer. I'll just pay for the park, uh, but mm-hmm. I, I can't, I can't mm-hmm. have a softball game there. But I'm going to use this shit out of this ocean. And uh, I had a nice, now... I, I got myself, and I'm a little unclear on the science here, but I got myself a waterproof backpack because uh, I have been swamped a time or two, either launching uh-huh. or uh, returning from okay. sea. But not capsizing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I, did I scoop you? No, I I, I don't I don't mean yeah. You don't look I'm, like a capsizing kind of guy. No, it, it, let me tell you. Oh boy, I uh, it was very calm waters, <laughs> and I uh, launched very successfully, and I went for a long, wonderful, peaceful, soul cleansing oh. paddle through the bay. But by the time I'd returned back to the place where the um, or the kayaks were, the waves had picked up a little mm-hmm. bit. And uh, you're basically just sitting there and you position yourself towards shore and you try to kind of look back, like, because the swells will come in in, in groups. Because mm-hmm. you want to hit those little waves going, or big waves either way, going forward or backwards, not sideways. Uh, sideways is going to fuck you, you want, up. What you want is as much tranquility as you can find right, and then but. you can paddle yourself in and then a little wave will take you calmly to the right. shore. But sometimes sets roll in yeah, and there'll be three or four yeah. decent sized yeah. waves. And I just went, eh, it was calm. And I started paddling in. And, uh, now I took my sunglasses off. I took my earbud out mm. and I had my phone. I put it all in my waterproof backpack. But the backpack is not as waterproof as is advertised. Yeah, I feel like if it's submerged, it's, not so much. If, it, if, if you pour a cup of water on it, maybe you'd be okay. Yeah, they but mean in a light rain. The yeah. material is, but the zipper, right. the it's water right. finds a way. And uh, I was paddling in. I was doing good. There's always somebody on the beach to witness this. They have to be. There's one dude standing there. He's just watching you the whole time. Paddling, good. Caught a wave. Got the theme from uh, Hawaii Five-0 in my ah. head, and I'm, I'm carrying and then all of a sudden I notice this, the wave is a little bigger than I would have liked, and I notice the front end as I'm coasting down the wave. I think the surfers call it purling. Mm. That's when the front end kind of digs oh. in, and the front end dug in, and it was oh. ass over tea kettle. Oh my God. Backpack, you, uh, line, everything. It, <laughs> by the way, yard you, sale. you go through the, the spin cycle very quickly. You go from high and dry to wet cat boom you, like you that you pole vaulted it yeah and those things aren't 
they're fine when you're out in the calm water. They're not really made for a wave. And oh. anyway, I got swamped and uh, the backpack went floating into shore and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, my, uh, my phone got moist. Mm. I don't know if it uh, it got submerged, but it did, did, and it was acting weird and whatever, but it sort of came back online, and then uh, everyone always says, you got to put it in the rice. Yeah, bag of rice. Put it in the rice. I don't know if that's real, but that's what they say. It feels for many people. I have to. It it felt a little wives' tale to me. Uh, By the way, when you say rice, put it in rice, you can leave out the uncooked part. How... (laughs) I'm not going to grab a pot of r- yeah. boiling rice and throw it in the pot. Pack in the microwave. <laughs> Counterintuitive. I, I get it. Uh, but uh, okay, I appreciate the specificity of right. it. Um, I did not because it worked. Uh, it sort of, sort of came back online, sort of worked, and it, it was fine. But then when I woke up this yeah. morning, it was not working. Yeah. And uh, had this weird naked feeling, like no phone. Freeing? Mm, mm. Causes a little bit of a panic. <laughs> Yeah, and it fi- ironically got an, an email saying, uh, hey, something a little urgent business-wise. Can we get on the phone? And I was like, no, no we cannot. Can't, cannot get on the phone. But um, it uh, it is now sitting in rice. I think that ship has sailed. I feel like it sailed as well. You know, but- there's an app that I've used in emergencies before that works. And I think we've talked about it. I it, it, They have different ones, but it basically vibrates your phone at a certain frequency and oh, so it kind of shake shakes the water, the water out from inside mm. but i think you need to go to the nerd geeks yeah. squad yeah. or whatever they're my called. phone the won't, won't yeah, boot up at this yeah, point to accept an app yeah. but uh weird feeling somewhat tranquil and then somewhat panicky like my phone my phone right. i don't know what time it is i can't talk to people so um it's sitting in a sack of rice right now and we shall we shall see what happens oh, nice. i i was in uh brea Mm-hmm. And uh, did a couple of shows with Dennis Quaid. We we know that. But uh, hey, real quick for Bray, I'm sorry. Just on the mm. last subject, you may have thought of this yourself. Maybe it's been suggested suggested to you. But uh, gallon size Ziploc bag inside the inside the uh, the backpack. Whatever's in there, obviously not going to get touched. Should have uh, should have done it. Mm. Um, it was like I think it was, the the jury was out on whether it was a waterproof backpack <laughs> or not. Water resistant. And I. I'm kind of like the guy who smokes when he's welding. I'm like, I can handle this. Mm. Nothing's going to happen. Mm. I was like, eh, it's calm out there. Mm. I'm just going to last few times I went out, I just coasted right back to the to the land. So I was like, I feel pretty confident. And then I got hellaciously swamped, like, <laughs> turned over, you know, just pushed under. Were you separated from the kayak? Oh, yeah. The first thing that happens is kayak separation anxiety. I see. You get thrown, you get swamped. It is no, you don't, it's like when you, you don't sort of miss. You miss or you make it. Right. When you miss means you completely underwater and being spun around and the kayak flying over your head. That's, that's how you don't really just dip a shoulder and pop back. You just got winged. No, you, it's either nothing or, or everything. I, I crash landed. Got it. So, um, but I was in Brea and uh, Shatner came out there and I got to tell you, man, um, I was so impressed by this guy who's going to turn 91 in a month and a half. Um, sitting there, <laughs> bo- sitting there before I before I even got there, he was sitting in the green room, um, interested is, in hell as hell in women's downhill skiing. Oh boy! Okay. Excited, timely, excited for that. Um, had a great time with him up on stage. Fast, funny, lucid. And and not to be glib, but standing. Not like you gotta offer him a seat and he's helped in and helped no, out. No, no, he did this uh he did this move where he he came out funny as a joke. He had the mask on and he had dark sunglasses. Oh, we're looking at it now. And he was Look kind of a tan suit. He, he, he was, kind of puttering. He was shuffling yeah. and puttering. <laughs> and then he got in front of the audience, dropped the mask, dropped the shades, stood up straight. Went, how, Here I am. How Laurel. very Willy Wonka of him. <laughs> I know the place, the place went nuts and uh funny cell, fast, great lucid, picture. great guy. And he kept coming up to me. Yelling in my face. We're looking at a bunch of people. You can go to AdamCroll.com. I think we'll 
put these pictures up there. But Shatner was awesome. And uh, then there was two hours between the shows, and he did the early show. So Mike ordered a bunch of dinner, and uh, there's a empty restaurant that's attached to the club called uh, Copper Blues. There's nobody in there. We just sort of use as our staging, wardrobe, makeup, whatever. Um, but he brought a bunch of food from the steakhouse, which is also attached, but busy and crowded. And uh, then Shatner and I just proceeded to sit in an empty restaurant, an empty booth, and, and have dinner together. And all he did was ask me questions the, the entire time. Wow. Now, you'd think he'd be waxing on mm-hmm. about whatever back in the day or that, uh, you know, he's a good friend of Quincy Jones or, or something. All, all he did was ask me questions the mm. entire time. He was very interested in comedy and stand up comedy. He wanted to know, you know, where I got started, what I did. What I was doing. He, he, and it was, I, I felt guilty because the entire meal I spent just going, well, then I was a carpenter and then I did this and then I went to the radio station and, all he did was ask questions the entire time. And and I was your self esteem confused? It was. And then I was also like, Oh, I guess this is how you get smart. You sit down with people and you just ask them things. Yeah. And um I I just I couldn't have been I even if he if he was thirty seven, you would have been wildly impressed by him. But my I realized my dad is about four months younger than Shatner. Uh, both 90. And when I go visit my dad, uh, the conversations take a little while. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, you're uh, your um, uh, stepmom. Uh, she's uh, she, uh, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Lynn. Mm-hmm. She 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 called the uh, the grandkids. Uh, what? Uh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, what? Uh, to the boy. Uh, what's this? Like, that's what the conversation's like, because he's he's 90. Yeah. He's not losing his mind. It's just you don't you don't have the command. You, right. you just can't grab the words or the names, the, the places, right. the faces like you kind of see everything in your head. But you're like, what? The you can't name translate of that? it. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not coming out. Not Shatner, man. He is sharp as a tack. Funny, friendly, like easy. It, it was uh, it was it was good fun. Nice. Um, did he come with any uh, material? Or did, he, did he try anything out? He's he does not fancy himself a, a stand up, but yet he is. He he really gets up there, faces the audience, tells a story, has a punchline. Oh, I can see him hamming it up just he, fine. He he does. He told a joke. Like he brings it. This just popped into my mind. So Chris, forgive me, but. I think there was an SNL sketch when he hosted from back in the John Lovitz days, our guest coming up, where he is talking in front of people. He's at a Star Trek convention. He's playing William Shatner. Oh, yeah. And, and he, the, the, the essentially, I'm going to get the words wrong, but it's like, uh, you people, this is, a, this is a huge, massive waste of time. You <laughs> turn what was a lark and do it to a, 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 a lifetime of folly. I, I think if, if anyone says, do you remember when Shatner was on SNL? That's what they remember. Yeah, it's that a sketch. sketch. He's he, berating this group of Star, yeah. you know, uh, Star Trek uh, conventioneers. Well, maybe we can find that. He took, a, he took a fair amount of heat, I think, for making fun of those That's people. A great well, he's, he's earned it. He's also, every time I bring up George Takei, he's always like, I don't. I don't even really know that guy. <laughs> like he just showed together forty five years ago. And as Shatner is quick to point out, a show that he was on set for Shatner mm. every day. Takei would come in once a week, shoot his scene, and then leave. Right. Like he wasn't there all day, every day. But I did. It did strike me that when I half the people that hate me, I do end up saying. I don't really even know that person. I don't know where they're, where do they, where do they get this? That'll uh, give way to a, a tweet. Some um, waiter, waitress, waiter sent out a tweet saying that uh, she waited on me and Tim Allen. And um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> this plus, is in response to your AOC thing. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so. she's uh, Angie says, plus he's a jerk in person. He and Tim Allen dined at a restaurant I used to work at years ago, both assholes and poor tippers. All right, so let's really break down. Well, then I responded. The response uh, is my favorite. <laughs> I remember you. You were that shitty waiter. 
Now, first things first. Dozens clap. I've been out to dinner with Tim Allen once. Uh, we went to Morton Steakhouse with Kevin Hench. And there's a couple things. First off, uh, I uh, I may be a jerk. Maybe Tim Allen's a jerk. Maybe Kevin Hench is a jerk. But rarely to the waiters. You just mm-hmm. there's not enough time. They they come by. You order. You give the special. You add. If you, you ask them if you're going to add a shrimp to the shrimp cocktail right. to get an even number out of it, and then they then they yeah. leave. It's a Hollywood cliche that I'm guessing is a little overblown, a little overdone. Oh, the, the you know the star who came in it was a dick to everyone. It's like I don't, I don't know. If the, I'm sure it happens once in a while. But well, also not as much as you'd think. dicky people are dicky during shitty circumstances. So go mm. tell them that you backed into their car and dented in the quarter panel, or you go tell them that uh, the shoot has been pushed back two hours or something, then they get shitty. Most of the time when you're going out to dinner, you're in a, even the shitty people are, are in I'm going to enjoy myself mm. mode. Yeah. But um, the thing that's funny about this is that uh, me and Tim were, were both dicks <laughs> to the waiter, uh, but also that we're poor tippers, both of us. Which then would suggest <laughs> that Tim Allen and I would go out to a steak dinner and whack I up cons- the bill. Yeah, conspire to. <laughs> you had the cornbread. Stiff them. Yeah, Tim, you had a martini. I just drank yeah. the diet coke. So <laughs> a shrimp cocktail had four shrimp, and the three of us. So someone here. <laughs> well, yeah, well, let me tell you what rich guys don't do. They don't go out for steaks and then ask for two separate bills, like right. we're all at the fucking Waffle House in junior college. So. <laughs> There's a hole in this person's statement, which is we're both shitty tippers because only one of us could have tipped. Right. So well, if one was loudly egging the other on, like, no, low baller. <laughs> that would have been egregious, though. I can't see that happening. That would be, like, fetishistic. Yeah. yeah. And it's also, it's such weak sauce that, oh, they came in and they waited on them and they were assholes. They were shitty tippers. It's indefensible. You could say that about anybody, anytime. No one could yeah. ever vet it or source it or any of it. Somebody came to my defense, though, according to Chris. I didn't, I was not aware of this, but... Um, Oh. Somebody said, I was a caterer on every year of the man show, and Adam was, was one of the nicest, most approachable celebrities I've ever met. Uh, Angie must be bad at her job. There you go. <laughs> Even waiters that are bad at their job, I'm not mean to, by the way. <laughs> but um, thank you for uh, saying that. Uh, vote Fonzie <laughs> on um uh, on Twitter. Sometimes I think when people say like they were assholes and I think this can absolutely be applied to the situation, you didn't pay them the attention they were hoping to get from you. You know what I mean? Or it's 100% made up. That but I'm saying like you like they asked what you wanted and you ordered but mm. you didn't, you know, shoot the shit yeah, for you a were while. Jovial. Right, you you were polite and, and and ordered and then went back to your conversation. I think people look at Kurt sometimes as rude. It was like, "No, no I'm just to the point. I like is what I'll I'd have like to a rib eye. Right. <laughs> I uh I do think that um well, I know this person's lying because they said we're both bad tippers, mm. so that be careful. Look, when you're going to roast somebody, uh, do it, but follow a course of logic. Yeah. There's no way. I haven't whacked up a bill with a rich person in 27 years. It's just, it's it's a part of the past. Yeah. Do you remember that past when you used to like itemize the bill and kind of figure out everyone? This is, you know, in the, in the high school days. Or like high school, or yeah. You know, well in my 20s, yeah. sadly. Oh, I remember going out to like a Bob's big boy with five dudes and then ordering the drinks, which would be a Coke on a separate charge on like a separate bill. For some reason, the grift was you then play rock, paper, scissors to see who has to pay that. And then you just go up and pay for the bill of the sodas mm. versus the burgers mm. and the sodas, which I definitely participated in wow. before. I'm, I'm ashamed to say. That's a new low. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, there was that. I couple things. I heard in the news uh, on the way in that uh, the Super Bowl may set a record for the warmest day of a Super Bowl. Interesting. And uh, I thought, interesting. All the Super Bowls in L.A. and Arizona, or excuse me, Florida and Arizona. I'm surprised, but here we are. Said it may set a record, which was uh, 84 degrees. 
And then I thought to myself, oh, and then it said uh, set at the Los Angeles Coliseum, but in the past. But my first impulse when we're going to set a record for temperatures, I thought, ooh, is this global warming? Like, what's going on? Except for the last record was set in 1973. In Los Angeles. In the Coliseum. (laughs) So it's been 50 years. Maybe there is global warming, but it's hard to connect it now because it's been 50 Mm -hmm. years and it's in the same location, essentially. But yeah, they think 84 was the last one, and they think this one uh, may just get to that. Apologies if this came up when I was away, but are you, are you going to go to the game? No. He likes the Come big on. screen. I, I like the big screen. There's no, there's no bigger screen than it's SoFi. And <laughs> I won't say half, but uh, a good, good portion are the commercials. I like watching That's the your, commercials your 100% right. as well. Uh, I, I also heard that the viewership for the Olympics was way down. Oh, was it? And uh, I thought... I didn't, wasn't for sure they were even happening. It was like, are the Olympics happening now? But here... Oh, we have the Shatner SNL clip. But I'll give you my theory on the viewership, which isn't exactly politics and China and Uyghurs and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's something else. And I'll, I'll tell you what it is. But first, we're going to take a look <laughs> at the old Shatner. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's Kevin, John Lovitz. Right and Kevin Nealon's going to ask him a question. <laughs> That's, a, That's great. That's Harman's great, great, even with no lines. Yeah. Just, just, just just facial the expressions are great. Yeah, he was uh, funny. Funny enough, I, I forgot about this sketch. I forgot it started with the birth of a baby horse. Um, I forgot about that, yeah. I was sitting in the green room with him and he was talking about his horses and one just gave birth uh, and how beautiful it is. I mean, he, the majesty of it and riding like, you know, every other day or whatever. It's also funny when people, uh, people always say this. I think Mike came in and he's like, you ride every day. And then the answer is always, no, not every day. I, I have, I'm here to, <laughs> I'm in Brea. Today, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like I have like gigs my and teeth. work, like I, I travel for things. I do like four or five days a week, which for a 90-year-old man is right. super yeah. impressive. Do the math on every day. But breeding them and breaking them and training them and the, the whole the whole nine yards. Are they for show? What what are, what, for show? what do they do? <laughs> I I was, uh, I, I, Mike, I think, wanted to know if he sold them or yeah. how he worked. And he said sometimes, but always kind of breaks his heart and and blah, blah, blah. But it's like you with the cars. It just gave, he did, one of his horses just gave birth. Wow. Um, all right. So the Olympics. Viewership. Mm. Viewership. And you guys tell me, I was watching SportsCenter last night. And of course, so-and-so were playing the Montreal Canadiens in an empty arena. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, of course, everybody... All the arenas are full except for in Canada mm-hmm. because there's something going on in Canada that's different than the rest of the entire free world. E- evidently, I don't know what strain of the virus they're being infected with, but for some reason, every other arena's filled to capacity and Canada's empty. And I watched like a few seconds, a guy made a great goal, like highlights and stuff, but no audience means not that much excitement for some reason. True. We're wired in a certain way. I, I always think about this. In porn, the condom ruined it for a lot of people. Mm. And I thought, why does it ruin it for us? And it's like, I don't know. Just did. It just did. And why do you need a capacity stadium to watch a highlight or a goal right. or an exciting you game? And it's like, you just kind of do. Yep. And... And then I start thinking about the uh, miracle on ice. I think it was. Yes. Uh, you know when when 1980 the, uh, Winter Olympics. Winter Olympics when the U.S. hockey. What if that was done in front of an empty arena? Oh my God! You it, would, a little less energetic. They, they wouldn't have made a movie about it. That's they wouldn't true. have made a movie about it, and the highlights would be boring yeah. too. Mm-hmm. And oh, Michael, what are you yelling for? Yes. And then <laughs> I was watching clips from the female Olympic hockey us versus canada or something last night in china in an empty venue and i thought 
I'm not sucked in by this. Like, no. I want the people going nuts. Oh, I want them the, waving the Canadian yeah. flag and the they're American doing the flag. They're venues in China. I thought I would oh, watch too much it of is that. on such lockdown that really? there are specific taxi drivers that are only for the Olympics, and they have signage everywhere saying if the taxi driver gets in an accident don't help him if you're outside the bubble we have our own people inside the bubble that will help oh like my. they don't want any interaction at all someone should tell trudeau i can't tell the difference between your hockey arenas and china's hockey arenas okay i can tell the difference between sweden or florida or texas or any any free place but not yours is that that bother you at all so I think that there's a lot of political stuff going on. There's a lot of whatever. But doing everything in an empty venue, yeah, it just kind of takes away. It's and part and, of the tableau of sports is the screaming crowd. The crowd goes, the crowd goes wild. Right. And, you know, as I was, I was watching a 30 for 30 on the tuck rule last <laughs> night. Is that from RuPaul's Drag Race? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it begat. I see. RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, and now I'm just picturing Gillette Stadium empty. Yeah. You know, with all just, the snow just coming snow, down. Just white out in the, in the stands. How yeah. bleak. I, it just, it, and, and I was trying to think, like, what is, is it, 30%? It's like 50%. Like, if they played oh, yeah. a Super Bowl in an empty stadium or the Olympics or the hockey playoffs or whatever, it's like no crowd kind of means no bueno. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, it, it's it's a bunch of elements Everyone's always sort of talking about the political side. I think the zero crowds, especially yeah. also for stuff like, I don't know why, oddly, but uh, like pairs figure skating or singles yeah, figures. It's always... doing it in an empty place. It yeah. just doesn't, when the guy pulls off the triple axle triple and, sow cow. and sticks it. Yeah, there's nothing. Crickets. You know what a bit effect? A bet what it affects is when someone tunes in, like me, unbeknownst of the crowd thing, and like there's a hockey game on, or there's uh, figure skating, and there's no reaction. Mm -hmm. It's like in the back of your mind, in that cortex, you're like, "This is not interesting. This is not yeah. exciting." Yeah, must have been, even, yeah. Even though it's the same action on the the, the the ice or the what or the ice in this case, you're like, "Oh, not exciting." No yeah, I was cheering. I've crowd's dead. I've often cited in the biggest. Probably the biggest upset fight of heavyweight history, Mike Tyson versus Buster Douglas, took place in Japan. Uh, capacity crowd, but the Japanese don't mm -hmm. scream and go nuts. And so when Buster Douglas was whooping up on Mike Tyson, which was, he was a 50 to 1 underdog, it was unthinkable. If that had been Vegas, people would be going bananas. But it was in Japan, they were subdued. And you're watching it, and it didn't feel like that much was happening right. because you couldn't hear the crowd going absolutely nuts. All right, let me tell you about Simply Safe. Today's episode is brought to you by Simply Safe Home Security. Ever wanted to know what's happening when you're not home? Well, new wireless outdoor camera from uh, Simply Safe lets you see what's happening outside right from your phone. Well, not my phone, but your phone. Uh, this is a great company. And again, you could, I can't use my phone today, but I can check, see what's going on out in the yards. Pool man doing his job. What's Phil doing out there? Everything to keep your home safe. Entry and motion sensors, indoor and outdoor cameras, 24-7 professional monitoring, ready to dispatch police, firefighters, and EMTs. Less than a buck a day. No long-term contracts or commitments set up in just about 30 minutes. Customize your home's perfect system in just a few minutes. Go to simplysafe.com slash Adam. Get your free indoor security camera plus 20% off interactive monitoring. Two eyes, simplysafe.com slash Adam. All right, big Oscar roundup with Baldywood right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam. Watched NFL games with nine people cooked up some nice gourmet brats for everyone laid out all the accoutrement like uh, mustard and sauerkraut and i had three people going to the refrigerator to grab ketchup gross take care you can leave us a message at 888-634-1744 can i say you know you know there's the uh news stories that we're all tired of mm -hmm. and they're 
they're, they work in cycles. I got them today. The news, <laughs> the news about <laughs> gets on to a certain subject, and then they all kind of feed off it. Uh, the how much extra your Super Bowl party is going to cost this year? Oh, not, interesting. Not the interested. Chain, not, yeah. you know, seven layer dip is up 7%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whatever. It's, it's the I'll go to the fucking Trader Joe's. I, oh, and um, steak is up uh, 28%. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I won't serve steaks. <laughs> and uh, hot dogs are up 19%. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. We get it. Stop ruining and, and, everything. And then they do this weird thing where they go now. Chips and veggies are basically yeah. flatline. Yeah. All right. So I'll just do so chips and veggies. Those. Slowed up on celery sticks and lace. <laughs> Not to lose money year over year. Uh, well, first things first. If you're throwing a Super Bowl party, chances are you can pay the extra $31. Yeah. You won't notice. That would be a little higher than last year at this time. But Indeed. another goddamn news story. And it's just it's it's just it's just a breakdown. Yep. Chicken is up fourteen percent. Bratwurst bratwurst are up twenty six percent. Like I okay, I get it. I'm not I'm not factoring it in. Maybe I'm in a different bracket. I don't know. Don't, I think doesn't you're, feel I think you're reasonable. I feel that newsy to me. Yeah. It's, it's and not. it also is what it is. No no one's going to throw a Super Bowl party and go. No dip this year because it went up thirteen percent. Yeah. Uh, Byod. We, avocados for some reason are the same price so now we're supposed to eat guac but we can't do the seven layer dip you can thank the cartels for that yeah, yeah. oh for the, yeah, avocados? the drug cartels are, are keeping avocado avocados everywhere oh, yeah, they make nice a lot of money off of them oh, is good, it good. oh it's a huge Thanks. markup i i, I you stick fentanyl in the <laughs> seed. Yeah. I, I was looking now you get drugs and avocados anywhere, it was anywhere in it was interesting because i was watching the breakdown and um Everything is up. Mm-hmm. And then at the very bottom, it's like, avocados are the same. Because they're like, always six bucks a piece. Why? They're already expensive. Yeah. I, I, I would have thought if you would have got hold of me a year ago and went, what has gone up the most? I'd go, avocados. Yeah, in but, February? No. Wow. Uh, but so how's this work, Dawson? <laughs> uh, there's been news stories on it. The drug cartels have seized avocado farms in cartel-controlled areas. And they are running the trade, oh. and and uh, keeping the prices I fair. They're 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 at least making <laughs> sure avocados <laughs> get into the United States just as just as diligently as they're making sure drugs come into the United States. So we've got avocados. We're, I I, we're I know, yeah. and a, in a in a shortage of everything, wow. uh, and price hikes and everything. I'll see if I can find a news story. This. I wonder if we can get the cartels involved with plywood because plywood yeah. has gone up like 108 percent. I was going to say the avocado has nothing to do with the drug; it's just simple profit margin. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Well. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, remember, I don't. I don't yeah. want to hear another news story about the price of bean dip going up 11 percent. Are you Not sure? Not only am I uninterested, I'm marginally depressed, <laughs> and it is not going to factor in to my shopping. I want to make sure you're sure about that because I retweeted a CNN headline, headline news story, big breaking news from CNN. How tough is it to afford a home in this wild housing market? A lot of it depends on how much you earn and how many houses are for sale where you live. <laughs> so Hold supply on. and demand? Slow down. Let no me write that down. No shit, Dick Tracy. <laughs> you got to have an avocado grove in your on your property. It pay for itself. You know, this is like 24 hours a day. I'm looking at the housing prices. I'm figuring this out. I thought I was going to get some real news. It just depends on how much I make and if yeah. there are houses in the valley that are for sale. Yeah, I do love those. Good best, Jesus. best way to avoid a hangover after a Super Bowl party? Tell me, please. Don't drink. Oh, hold on. Let me get a pen. Best way to avoid an STD? Um, condoms? Don't have sex. Oh. Well, what about sunburn prevention? Oh, Don't go outdoors. Aloe. Oh, shit. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Baldywood, the uh, Oscar nominations came out. Yeah, they did. Early? Did they do that that thing where they Crack do it, it at 545 yeah. in the morning? As far as I know. Who and that? Do you remember who? Leslie Jordan and Tracy Ellen Ross. Thank you, Gina. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> wow. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Hooray for Bollywood. He will tell you if a movie's good. 
Brian will review the flicks that he's seen up on the big screen or in his Netflix queue. Before you spend bucks, remember his taste sucks. He loved that train wreck piece of shit, Transformers 2. Hooray for Bollywood! Oscar nominations are out. Uh, I uh, was in Big Bear this weekend. I did all my research on the drive home, so forgive me if I get a detail or two wrong, but I'll do my best. (laughs) Here's a fun fact about this year's Oscars. For the first time ever, two sets of married people nominated for Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress. Who is it? Uh, Javier Bardem and uh, Penelope Cruz, both nominated for Best Actor, Best Actress. And uh, I... Didn't even know they were married. Oh, what a fool I am. I, had, I, I read in a news story, uh, Jesse Plemons and Kirsten Dunst yeah. for the same movie, Wow, Power of the Dog. Love that. Yeah, they. I think they met on Fargo, like season three, I think. That's, I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, you're not a TV guy. <laughs> Uh, I hate snubs. You all know how much I hate the word mm-hmm. snow snubs. Let's talk about a couple of uh, non-nominees who maybe deserved the nomination. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Bradley Cooper uh, from Licorice Pizza was just fantastic. As Ryan. Uh, yes. He was on screen for less than four minutes. Felt like five. How was that movie? <laughs> I loved it. And I want to see that. I oh, just saw it. <sighs> it. It was like a cross between, which a movie you hate, Rushmore and Almost Famous, which you think would make for a great movie. And it was fun. It was just it was just long and disjointed in the sort of fantasy of the valley in the 70s. We'll get there, but I, I will say it's a grower, not a shower. I didn't mm. love it immediately, and the more I've sort of ruminated on it, mm. I, I, I did I did like that movie quite a bit. Jared Leto in The House of Gucci was over the top and silly and fantastic, did not get a nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Uh, Dennis Villeneuve, despite Dune getting, oh, how many nominations did Dune get? Ten! Oh. Not nominated for Best Director. Very odd, very unusual. Mm. And uh, as discussed with Christian Toto, what, a week or two ago, well, time doesn't mean anything to me anymore. A couple of weeks ago, uh, The Last Duel, no nominations. Oh, that's right. You really oh, like yeah. that, Matt I, Damon. I thought it was one of the best movies of the year. Apparently not. I was saying before uh, the mics heated up, have we figured out who's hosting? And then uh, Brian said they haven't announced yet. As far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then I realized, and Brian, I think, uh, agreed. Just announce it day of. Yeah. Or just have them walk out on stage. Don't give the hater, don't give the mob any time well, to first off, protest. That is genius. Someone's going to compile an N-word montage yeah. of whoever gets the nod, right? Right. So you give them 72 hours, we're going to see a nice N-word oh, montage. Chris Rock, oh boy. Yeah, I mean, whoever, they'll, they'll find it. That's a really good idea. So let's just have the curtain open and... Yes. Be surprised. And that would do huge things for ratings since the ratings have That's been true. falling off on that too. Everyone's going to want to tune in to see who the host is. You know right. me, I hate to be the voice of reason, but does anyone in that room think that that could actually happen? Why, Why not? not? There's I no mean, get leaked, way. But... There is no way. No. Oh, you mean the you mean someone would they would leak. somebody would leak work. it. They would it, yeah. it would be major news, it'd be I, blown up and then Well, I get it, but let's give it the old college try. I'm yeah. Talking. By the way, I feel like people have stopped trying at college. We need to move yes. on. The old construction <laughs> yeah. workers try or something. Well, I had this discussion with somebody uh, a, a while back. Um, they said pretty much exactly what you said. And my reply was the college try is it's very little effort. It's not It's not an effort. It's a oh, it's like discounted effort. Yeah. Oh, It's like, I'll, I'll give you the old try. college try. Is that what the adage means? That's what it means. It means you're not putting any effort into it. Oh. Oh, it's the old college try. Uh, yeah, I never knew looked that, that one up because you don't you don't work hard in college. But I feel like regular this college in this thing like from the 30s or something. <laughs> Did they I don't think, think so. Party in the 30s. Know. I I feel the way I always understood it was that way. Give it the old college try <laughs> means it. to put read it <laughs> read it. <laughs> To put to, forth one's very best effort. <laughs> wow. I, I Off into an outside degree. I 100% disagree with that. And, and I've been, yeah, I know I 100% disagree with that. They're wrong. Okay. Well, they're wrong in that people don't work hard at college or whoever invented this Given in the 1932. Old from, Man. Yeah. Maybe back then. In yeah. 1932, because well, what, 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 what the colleges are around, listen, Harvard here's and Here's the thing Yale. about the adage, uh, you know, you know, well, stitch in time saves nine. Back then, <laughs> they're talking about being a seamstress. Things have changed. You, you can't yeah. do that. It's whatever they meant. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, Miriam I, I have never there's used no more, it that way. There's no more stitching or skinning cats or even swinging cats around and Dead hitting hit a something. Patriots fan that we don't do. We don't condone swinging cats anymore in hitting Republicans True. in Orange County or whatever, whatever it's applied to. <laughs> But it still meant something to the person who conceived it. Yeah, well, Merriam-Webster yeah. says okay. it's to try very, very hard to uh, use one's best efforts. I have never in my life used it like that because <laughs> I went to college and I really didn't try. But you also went, wait, you got you, you went, not Santa, did you yeah. go to Santa Barbara? I went to UC Davis first. Oh yeah, UC Davis and then. And then UCSB. Yeah, I had a, yeah. I had a davis somewhere yeah. in my head well they don't try look the 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 the, the 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 colleges that are in it where you can see the ocean they don't try that hard yeah maybe pepperdine. maybe pepperdine yeah. i don't know the Might religious the leader, yeah. right what year did that come out then chris the old college try Scott. um i'm still looking all right, here we go. Sorry, where were we? Okay, let's just uh, run down the uh, Best Picture nominees, and, and uh, you know, I'll categorize them best I can to see if you guys are interested. Or And uh, fair uh, fair warning, tried my best to see every Best Picture mm. nominee. Drive My Car, the Japanese film that is nominated, was playing only in theaters when I was on my COVID vacation. <laughs> so and so I, know, I couldn't go 98% to see that one. I heard on it's Rotten great. Tomatoes. It's I heard the it's great. highest Rotten Tomatoes score out of all of them. Wow. I'm excited to see it. I just hadn't gotten out to have a chance yet. So that one still is on my list. Everyone mm. else I've seen uh, in the uh, It's an Honor Just to Be Here, Just to Be Nominated category is uh, Don't Look Up. Don't look up. It should be just happy to be there. It's it's it's, it's a fringe nominee. Yeah. I would imagine it probably got ninth or tenth place it's, in the votes. It's promising young woman. Oh, you saw it. Yeah. Oh, we talked about this. Yeah. It's it's you're right. I mean, it, it culturally relevant. Everybody has an opinion. Some find it entertaining. Some don't. But best picture is a stretch. Yeah. It's, it's flawed. There's some good parts, no doubt. It's, it's got some funny parts. It's an Adam K movie. He mm -hmm. did uh, Vice and he had the big shorts. Just, just saw Vice. Really good movies. Uh, but this one is uneven and um, happy just to be there. It, I think we bring this up every year. Does. How many are? Ten? Ten now? this year. Ten is, nominees. Just, many. Does that feel like too many? Yeah. Like a couple of them are fringe players. No, very, very little chance to win. Then let's just go back to how it was. It's a smaller number of movies. Wasn't it six always? Five. Ah. But I mean, when, before they expanded. I mean, right. also, I, I'm not sure what they were doing. Maybe they wanted to be more inclusive or diverse or something. But it feels like I feel about movies like I feel about people that say they come from a family where there's like 13 kids. I'm like. Could you have really gotten the attention that yeah, you right. needed? It's a little diluted. Yeah, sorry. Remember four four ish years ago when they were toying with the idea of adding like a blockbuster category, like right. best best tent pole or whatever it would have been called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was in favor of that because like how many of the movies have you guys heard of? Probably half ish. Yeah. I mean, the average person what I'm saying doesn't doesn't even know these movies. It doesn't care, hasn't seen them, and they saw Spider Man or they saw right. Shang Chi and these are good movies, but they're not award movies, you know? So just to bring eyeballs in and make it a little more exciting, interesting, I'd yeah. be all for it. West Side Story was probably the most oh, sure. commercial out of this group. The other ones are like Belfast, heard about it, hadn't seen it. Coda, haven't heard about it. Don't Look Up, it's on TV. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Netflix, Drive My Car, not heard of. Dune, I've heard of. King Richard, maybe. I mean, I've heard of it. Licorice Pizza, I definitely heard of. Nightmare Alley, I've not heard of. Okay. The, the Power of the Dog, I've not heard of. And then there's West Side Story. We'll get to all those. So in the um, in the category of unremarkable in every way, Belfast and West Side Story. These are well-made movies, I suppose. Unremarkable. I, mm. I remember almost nothing about them. Uh, Belfast is in one eye and out the other. And as for West Side Story, um, I was going to ask you, Adam. Gina, yeah. uh, name a, uh, a, a relevant a musical artist uh, these days. Someone who is someone who is relevant to musical uh, culture. Uh, like in music culture? Yeah, yeah. Billie Eilish. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. So West Side Story is almost a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the original. Obviously, this one's in color. There's nothing... It's in color, the classic. Interesting. How dare you? There's nothing interesting about it. There's nothing new about it. What if Billie Eilish made a song-for-song -song remake of Sgt. Pepper and released it, and it was like up for best album? 
Like, right. uh, there's like, you can't do that. That's just a cover album. Right. You just cover an entire album. That's, uh, this is un, undeniably a good movie made by a master filmmaker, but why did we need West Side Story in our lives? I heard an interview with, not Spielberg, somebody else talking about it, and they said, we think that West Side Story should be updated every 20 years, you know, every 30 but years. But that's in the Heights! And by the way, those they have nothing to do with each other. How racist, there's, Brian? There's just because they're both Puerto Ricans, yeah, of, I, didn't I, Dominican? I didn't notice that actually. <laughs> I, I'm with Brian in that um, half of the movies in the execution of it, and then the other half is writing, story, original, whatever, yeah. whatever. And if you're just going to go shot for shot, that ain't best picture material. Agreed. Um, uh, by the way, the story goes, and this is not uh, confirmed. The story goes: Spielberg wanted very badly to direct In the Heights. Which he did, it did not uh, go to him. Mm. Uh, I think it was, I'm going to fuck it up. But it, 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 he did not get it. And he's like, fuck it, I'm going to remake West Side Story. So this that is, like is, a, this very is a, interesting. This is F me movie. Wow. Um, the old college try goes back to 1917. As yeah. uh, at least Chris could find. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of baseball publications really were, were uh, writing about it. Like fielders would give it the old college try to grab the ball and stuff like that. And college meant something. Yeah, yeah. that's what right. we used to try. Uh, so the next, so uh, three movies uh, that are good, but beware, these are very long and very slow. So when you go to see them, don't expect something to pop. Uh, Dune. Mm. Dune is a really good movie. It's fucking very long, and it turns out that it's part one oh my of God. two. Adam, you would hate it. Why would I hate it? it it's is very, so very goddamn dusty. boring. Oh, I thought you were gonna say dusty and dusty. It's, it's, it's set it's... on a on a on a, on a, 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 de- a desert planet. Yeah, where they're mining for Didn't spices. They already make yes. this movie C- with yeah. Kyle MacLachlan. They made a very see here. That's I'm glad you brought that up. I like that, that movie. This actually. is a remake, but this is an inspired remake yeah. of a bad movie. Like it's mm-hmm. a celebrated novel. Dune was a bad movie from 1980 or whatever I it was. Liked it. It was cheesy. Yeah, that's but what I this think. This is an, an excellent maybe adaptation. That's it. Maybe that. Maybe I felt like this just took itself too seriously. I just don't care. It's heavy and dry, dry. It's in a fucking desert. Yeah. So it's very dusty, Adam. But I'm not sure you would actually enjoy it. Don't like dusty. Power of the dog. Also very dusty. Also very long. I know also anything about it. Slow. It's that's not the Channing Tatum. No, that's the that's the dog rescue movie okay. from where he drives cross country with the dog. Right. No, this is okay. Power of the Dog is very good. It's the favorite to win Best Picture right now. Uh, it's Jane Campion who did the piano, celebrated mm-hmm. director. Uh, it's a western, which is hilarious because there's going to be some boomers who are suckered into seeing this movie. Like, oh, it's up for twelve Oscars and it's a western. Let's see it, honey. And it is slow and it involves um, alternative lifestyles, circa 1900. Oh, and, but it's very good. It's Benedict Cumberbatch. It's just Plemons and their brothers, and uh, just, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is the alpha male. He's very, very <laughs> gruff and rough, and Plemons is a little more refined, right? And he uh, he falls in love with Kirsten Dunst, his real life wife, and it's all about their interaction, how the families kind of fold together. It's long and it's slow and it's a little bit dry, but it's undeniably good. So just be aware when you go to see it. And finally, Nightmare Alley, which is a remake of a 1947 movie. It is. It is. This is a movie in 1947. And this is another good remake where they, honestly, this is Guillermo del Toro yeah. who won the Oscar for The Shape of Water. And he uh, he improved on a lot of things about this already kind of classic movie that not a lot of people had seen. I hadn't seen it before this. Uh, but Nightmare Alley is Bradley Cooper. He's the lead. He's kind of a con man. He's a carny. And he goes mm-hmm. off on his own. And it's all about mind games and who's playing who. And good movie. Just very, very, very Slow. I haven't seen either of these, so I guess that's why I keep mixing up Nightmare Alley and One Night in Soho. Very different. You've seen them both. I've seen them both. Okay. One Night in Soho is Edgar Wright, and that is um, kind of a time travel murder mystery. Okay. There was a Sly Stallone movie from the 70s called Paradise Alley. Say, oh. And that's all I got. Okay. That's great. Uh, the most pleasant surprise of these 10 movies, the one that I went into being like, I don't, I don't want to see this. I know what it's going to be. King Richard. Yes, King I'm Richard so happy to was, hear that. was surprisingly good. <laughs> I, oh, I found right. this to be very Will Smith. Will Smith. Will Smith plays Richard Williams, yeah. the father of Serena and Venus, uh, and, and two other daughters who they don't, you know, give short shrift to. He's very proud of all of his daughters. He Will Smith will probably win his first Oscar this year for this role. Yeah. He was he's a little Asperger's y, like he's very focused on tennis or his girl's success. I think the little girl got nominated from this movie for Best Supporting Actress. Oh, wow. Uh it was a Pleasant surprise. I really liked it. More, much more than I thought I would. So, uh, prediction. What do you think? There's two more I want to talk oh, about. Oh, sorry. The, the, my two favorite movies of this group 
Licorice Pizza, mm-hmm. which I saw at first. I was like, eh, you know, I wasn't not sure what to think about that. And the more it's steeped, the mm. more I've liked it. Well, we just saw it the other night, so maybe that'll happen. Maybe let it steep. Maybe I ask her time, you'll think differently about it. Adam, this is a movie you would like or at least be interested in, because in a sense, it's the poor man's once upon a time in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. This is rife with mid 70s valley specific references yes. and locations and characters. Mm-hmm. No, I love Paul I, Thomas Anderson, I should point out. Director of uh, Boogie Nights, uh, There yeah. Will Be Blood, etc. I love Tim all... Conway Jr. has a great uh, scene in this movie. He does. He has a cameo. I love all the little Easter eggs, and I love when they get it right. And it's, you know, it's self-serving because I grew up at the same time that Paul Thomas Anderson grew up. Uh, I know where he lived. I know his dad, Ernie Anderson, the voice of ABC, would mm-hmm. come into the liquor store that I worked in. He'd bring his little kids with him. I remember delivering... Coming up later tonight, a bottle of Jamesons. <laughs> yeah, I would deliver booze to their house and everything. So I remember Ernie was just... I lived for that guy. <laughs> like, because there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then. But when I would babysit and I would watch, you know, ABC on Friday nights, they, you know, I'd be, I'd, I'd, I'd get all excited, you know, it's going to be the love boat. Yep. Then it's going to be on fantasy Island. Mm-hmm. And then the, and then he'd always, he, and they, they do this thing. Everyone makes fun of it now, but it, it, it meant something back then. It's like, you're sitting there and it's like, then on the love boat, Barbie Benton's going to model nude. And I'd be like, <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and then he'd always, at some point, He'd go, then, on Vegas, someone's killing showgirls, and Dan wants to know why. <laughs> and I'd go, oh, they're going to kill showgirls. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. Oh, boy. And that's, he'd set the table for all that stuff, and that was Ernie. Well, there's a ton oh, of nostalgia in this. My, my weird <laughs> recollection, I remember it. I worked at the Flask. The Flask was on Ventura Boulevard, right in Studio City. And um, the Andersons lived right across the street from the CBS lot where the wash is, mm-hmm. right on Colfax there, just right there, that big corner spread with, uh, as I recall, a, a big fiberglass cow on the lawn. <laughs> and um, Ernie must have been into like high school sports or something because he, he kibitzed. It was kind of like back in the day when... You didn't go to Vendome. You went to the Flask Liquor if you were Ernie Anderson, and you knew all the guys right. who worked there, and you'd go get a couple of bottles of beef eater, right. and, you know, put it on my tab. Well, better and, yet, the usual Mr. Anderson? Yeah, bring, yeah. You have the guy bring it by the house, and he, he'd leave. You know, it was like he had an account, <laughs> they had a tab, you know, Old they'd tiny. deliver it. I'd deliver it to the guy's house. But Ernie Anderson, I just had recovered memory. I worked at the Flask when I was like 16 and 17, and... I was there for like two years. Ernie used to come in so much. It's like, oh, I knew who he was. He came in uh, after I made the the All Valley team. You know, there was a thing in the back of the Herald Examiner newspaper, back of the sports page, probably miniature letters of the the first team and the, the second team or whatever. And he came in. He's like, "Hey, we made the All Valley uh, team. I read that in the. I guess back when people read, the, they read the whole newspaper, you know. And I was like, oh, Ernie Anderson read the newspaper. I and he uh, remembers I made the All Valley team, or at least it deal. was fresh news yeah. back then. I was like, somebody read something that I was in, and that was Ernie. But yes, the Valley. When I was watching um, uh, Once, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you. You'd, you'd be driving along the freeway and you'd see the ADD van, the plumbing van go by. And it's like, I remember that van. I remember those commercials they used to run. Sorry. So well, that's like Rich Pizza. Right. And uh, some people still, you know, you know who stars in the movie, right, Adam? No. Philip Seymour Hoffman's son. His real life son. Mm. And as far as I can tell, it's only acting credit on IMDb. That's ver- who that guy he's is. very and good. The girl, the Carol Counterpoint, yeah. is a singer from the band Hame. Hame. And the whole family is in it. All of Hame is in yeah. it. The mom, the dad, the sisters. Oh, Hame. Imagine yeah. how hard it is to make that movie with two essentially unknown and experienced actors. Hame <laughs> open for the Foo Fighters when I went and saw them oh, some random. years ago. Yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. Well, also, it's funny because since it's kind of set in the same era, there, there's a lot of parallels between me watching Licorice Pizza and me watching Many Saints of Newark with both of 
the now deceased actor's sons oh, playing those roles, and they kind of look alike, and the they were show. playing the same 70s vibe, so it was interesting. Okay, well, let me finish this up with the, set, the other movie that was my favorite of these 10, which is CODA. Now, a lot of people are asking about CODA. What is CODA? CODA is an acronym. It's C-O-D-A, Children of Deaf Adults, and it's about a deaf family, but the one hearing member is their daughter, the daughter, the brother, the two parents. She can hear. The rest of them are deaf. Marley Matlin's in this, and uh, Troy Castor, I think, if I got that right. He was... Uh, I wrote this down. I take notes in every movie I see, so I don't forget. And I wrote down at the time, hold on, uh, the dad, Troy Coster, was put on this earth to play this role. If there's any justice in this world, he'd be up for Best Supporting Actor. He is up for Best Supporting Actor. I was so pleased by his performance, and I was so enjoyed this movie. If you're dipping your toe into the Best Picture movies, I told you there's some that are long and slow and challenging. Coda is very accessible. It's a fun movie. Uh, the girl has a dreams of being a singer. This is a movie that mm. the, most of the family can enjoy. Sorry, you, you may have just said this, besides Marley Matlin. Are the other actors actually deaf? I believe they are. I believe they're all hearing <clears> impaired. <throat> 96% on it's, Rotten it's Tomatoes. Great. It's streaming on Apple Plus, Apple TV Plus. So if you have that, you can uh, watch it. But I, I quite enjoyed it. All right. Thanks you have, for you have the some offering. other stuff nominated, or uh, you have some other stuff highlighted there. Do you have any uh, questions? Uh, or Lovitz is on hold, oh, okay. so we're, right. we got a minute and we'll get to him. Good roundup. Have All a right. good roundup. Why are you for Baldy All right, let me tell you about Keeps. Two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they are 35 years of age. Keeps, a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair convenient. Virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months in discreet packaging. Low-cost treatments start at just 10 bucks per month. Proven results, Keeps has more than five. I should say, more five-star reviews than uh, all its competitors. Check it out, and you can watch their, uh, go look at their before and after photos. The whole plan is you got to keep what you got. Prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so you have to act fast. It is keeps, right, Dawson? If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keps.com slash Adam to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keps.com slash Adam to get your first month free. keps.com slash Adam. Well, actor and comedian and singer John Lovitz up next. Pre-order Adam's sixth book. Everything reminds me of something. Advice, answers, but no apologies. It's insane. I blame everybody but me. Adam drops knowledge, rants, and laughs, answering actual questions from you, the listener, and some celebrity friends. Follow the link at adamcarolla.com to purchase on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or through IndieBound to find your local independent bookseller. Everything reminds me of something coming this summer, wherever finer books are sold. Now the great John Lovitz joins us. Good to see you, John. You too. Um, how much uh, stand-up? How much touring? How how much of that are you doing these days? Um, a lot. Besides, you know, going to clubs and uh, casinos across the country, I've been at the um, the Laugh Factory in the at the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas, and I'm there like um, it's kind of like a residency since july i do monday tuesdays and wednesdays at like seven o'clock which is you know not the prime time but but it's it's fun to do and um it's good practice you know and then and uh, harry basil runs it with the jamie masada and laugh factory and they're great guys Did- so i've really i really enjoy it it strikes me you grew up in the san fernando valley about the time uh i did and um, did you see the movie Licorice Pizza? No, not yet. I want to see it. Yeah, I heard I heard you guys talking about it. It all takes place in the valley. There's yeah, a, yeah, yeah pretty much sorry, I saw it. Yeah, pretty much the entire thing is this coming of age story set in the mid seventies in the valley. A lot of recognizable locations. Uh, you grew yeah, up- you know, actually I didn't see it, but I read something about it where um they said they shot stuff at Portola Junior High in the opening scene tarzana and i actually went to that school then in <laughs> in, in the 70s in the 70 and 71 
Is there? Uh, yeah, I should see it. Yeah, you grew up in Encino, right? Yeah, Encino, and then we moved to Tarzana when I was ten, in the '67. God, what uh, the valley, man. I mean, I remember in the 80s when I was working in Chatsworth, California, and there was open land out there. Like, uh, there was a lot of land. I, I built a commercial building, you know, industrial park. I didn't build it. I helped the guy build it. There was just vacant, right. just vacant lots, like Tarzana in the 60s, oh, yeah, we early used to go 70s. out there. There was Chatsworth Park, and we'd go, let's go to Chatsworth and climb the rocks. That was, like, the big thing to do, and... I remember um, Reseda Boulevard it, it, it would go up to this club. It was called Doville Country Club in 67. Now it's called Braemar. But it stopped about a mile and a half up from Ventura Boulevard. And then it was just the mountains. And we'd go hiking back there. They have the Indian caves. And now it just goes back for miles, all these houses. And my when in Tarzana, the street I lived on, it had no, uh, there was no sidewalks and there was horses everywhere. And <laughs> it, very, yeah, it was very different. And um, I liked it growing up. You know, it's like, it's weird. You go, yeah, you'd ride your bike everywhere. And it was fine, you know. Did, uh, I know your you, your family immigrated from uh, Russia and Romania and Hungary. Anyone cook any Hungarian food <laughs> at that house? Yeah, my my um, my mother's mother is from Hungary. Yeah, she'd make blintzes. So I don't know if that's Hungarian or Jewish, but very, that's what she likes. I think it's very Jewy. Eastern European in but general. You can be Hungarian and Jewish. <laughs> a I nice had, cheese that, blends. That was my grandfather. Jewy. Jewy, they're going to cancel you for Christ's sake. <laughs> Jew-esque. Jew-ish. I think you meant I think you meant Jewy. Jewy. Yes. Jewy. Jewy from Star Wars. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... John, I'm looking also down here. It says you sang at Carnegie Hall three times. I didn't, yeah. I forgot that part of your career. Well, the first time was it, there was a musical called um, Very Warm for May. And uh, Jerome Kern wrote it in 1950. It was his last musical in the 50s. Anyway, it only ran, or maybe the 40s, but only ran for like, I think, 54 shows and closed. closed. But there was a song from it called... Um, all the things you are, that's a very famous song. So they did a staged reading of it. There's Carnegie Hall next door to it. It's called Wild Recital Hall, which is about 400 seat theater, like a mini Carnegie Hall. So I performed there. And then a couple years later, um, a guy saw me perform there and he asked me to do a sing in the main Carnegie Hall. And the show was Ira Gershwin's 100th birthday celebration. <laughs> Great performances. So my joke, of course, was like, oh, great performances. The reviews are in. I haven't even hit the stage. <laughs> and um, but I got it was really exciting to sing there. And I got to see people like Rosemary Clooney, you know, George Clooney's aunt, you know, who's a world famous singer, was there. And Vic Damone and, and a, a, some guy who I forget his name. He wrote him. It was, he was a huge. He was in his 80s. Barton McLean or some Barton. Some, he, he he performed and then like three weeks later he passed away he was at christine eberstall and it was a michael oh. feinstein all these people but yeah i was just, and then the third time i sang there was it was for charity so i don't know if that counts what i, uh, I count it sorry really quick christine eberstall in licorice pizza oh really yeah she plays lucy i believe what uh yeah. when did you what year did you get to the groundlings and then uh who was there when you got there um, I started class there in 82 and then I got into, um, after a year I got in the Sunday company. I mean, the people that you've heard of that were in it were like, um, uh, Kathy Griffin and, um, Mindy Sterling. She was, you know, Mike Myers, she's the German and uh, Austin Powers, Mindy and, you just tweeted a picture of this, right? I feel like I just saw a picture of you with the Sunday Company, or somebody. Yeah, somebody did. did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mindy and, um, Mindy Sterling was my teacher instructor a couple of times at the ground because oh. she she got into some people would hang out and teach a lot of classes. I feel like Mindy did a lot of that. Yeah, I wanted to teach there. I needed them, and they go, "No, no." I go, "Why?" <laughs> they wouldn't let me teach, <laughs> but. uh <clears throat> Oh, and then uh, 
uh, Jay Kogan, he became a, a, a big writer and producer on The Simpsons. That's and then another guy that's on The Simpsons in that photo, that photo is John Frink. And um, and uh, Jay Kogan, when he was running the show, he he named two of the characters on The Simpsons after people from the grounds, which was John Frink, Professor Frink, and Steve Hibbert. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Dr. Hibbert. Dr. Hibbert. Oh, Steve Hibbert. Yeah. Dr. I remember Hibbert. Steve. By the way, then the real guy, Dr. Hibbert, Steve, he was the gimp in Pulp Fiction. Did oh. you know that? Oh my God. No. Did not know that. Fun. <laughs> but I remember Hibbert, I think, teaching, it was it's a little fuzzy because some people were there as part of the yeah, cast. Probably Steve Hibbert. Probably, yeah. And then some people taught the classes. And uh I was literally just citing the great, uh, you probably remember Cynthia Segetti from those. From oh, those sure, years. yeah. She was a big woman who was loud. And, uh, no, I remember. Yeah, very, yeah. She very, was nice. She, yeah. she, I never took class from her. Oh, well. When I got in the main company, though, they had Phil Hartman and they had a, a Tim Stack and a, and they had, who did Son of a Beast. They had Lynn Stewart, who oh, was, you Tim know, Missy Stack. Bunch, yeah. Pee -wee, Pee -wee, yeah. And they, and the Tress McNeil was in it. And she was like, you'll see her name on The Simpsons all the time. She's like the top voiceover artist in them. There's a lot, yeah, a lot of really talented people. It was, it was, I had a great time. That was like our whole life, the Groundlings. We, you know, friends, work, had parties, I, everything. I don't think people really know, and I don't know if we can recreate this today, but the Groundlings, when you were really ensconced in it, mm -hmm. it was your whole life. Sure. And, and, that. When when I got cut at the end and didn't make it into the Sunday company, I went into a a, a shame spiral, a depression. <laughs> like it was you were cut. It yeah, was like it was that, that feeling of, you know, being the star of the football team. And then the next year you graduate and you walk onto a construction site and someone hands you a shovel. It had like the same feeling <laughs> like, oh, my God, I've lost. Yeah. I'm, I'm not part of this anymore. It was no, really I, yeah, depressing. I get it. it it's hard. Yeah, yeah I, I could understand why, because it's so much fun. I mean, when I went there, I literally, I drove from uh, Woodland Hills. I was 25. I'm going to be a comedian. And I drove. And even though I grew up in the Valley, we, you know, the Valley, you'd always say the, the city, you go know, the other side of the hill, over the hill. And you wouldn't go there much, you know. And till you were older, but I remember driving there and I got in the freeway on like Canoga Park and uh, the Ventura Freeway. And I was like crying, like sobbing. I was so scared because <laughs> I was committing to being a comedian and no one was telling me to do this. You know, I hadn't had any jobs. I was unknown, but I finally went. And when I got on stage, I did some improv and the teacher, Randy Bennett, who was great. He's from Waco, Texas. Well, you could do it like this. You could do it like this. You and it was the first time in my life, you know, I was a class clown where people weren't saying, quit goofing off, quit fucking around. They're going, they're going you could be funny like this. You can goof off like this. Here's mm -hmm. another way you can goof off. You know, and, and and I was like, oh, my God, I'm home. I was thrilled. It is an interesting thing that we got, we got into a little bit um, last week on the show, which is I got the class clown designation. And I was thinking, you know, philosophically that you're, you're told to shut up, you're told to sit down, you're told to not to act out, told to zip it, I, you're, you're disruptive. Stop bothering people. I was told just go stand in the hall yep. and be quiet. Yep. And then at the end, you're, in a, you're awarded a prize of called Class Clown, which is just a weird mixed message. But you grow up, if you have a sense of humor, being told to shut up constantly. As it, And here's what I'm saying. There are other things in school that are they try to dissuade you from doing. They they don't want to encourage mm -hmm. this behavior. You know, being tardy. All right, you're tardy at school. Well, then no one celebrates your tardiness yeah. once you get to Most the workplace. <laughs> and they don't do it with lying or cheating or, or any of the stuff they want you not to do. But if you have a sense of humor, you're told to shut up and stand in the hall mm -hmm. for 14 years. And then you walk into the groundlings and you're celebrated. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden this trait, right. which yeah. was a liability, we shall now, not only are we going to celebrate, we're going to nurture it. We'll <laughs> see if we can find it. more of it. 
it, it's, it's right. It's an interesting mindset. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just was like thrilled. I remember when I, I went to uh, UC Irvine, <clears throat> I was a drama major. And in my third year there, um, they had a thing, Solar Energy Day. <laughs> and they put a, put a notice on the drama board on the, where they would do all the auditions and casting. They, got, they wanted someone to write a sketch for this. So I, I, I wrote one with three of my friends. So anyway, we performed it. And then in front of the library steps, there's about 350 people. And it went okay. And then um, this guy was performing next. And he says, can you introduce me as the first uh, stand-up comedian from Russia, Nikki Lennon? I go, okay. This, this was like 1978. So I go, all right, now from Russia, please welcome the first stand-up comedian you know, from Russia to perform in the United States, Nikki Lennon. And this guy did 45 minutes and he was not famous. No one knew who he was, but he was amazing. And it was Robin Williams. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and and um, so afterward, I said, you know, everyone was like dying laughing and it was great. I go, hey, that was so great. I go, I go did you see my sketch? Yeah, what'd you think? He goes, well, you know, at first you imitate other people, but then you find your own voice. And I said to him, by the way, can I ask you a question? I go, are people always saying to you like, you know, why aren't you ever, they would say to you, why aren't you ever serious? He goes, yeah. I go, yeah, me. He goes, yeah, all the time. I go, yeah, me too. I go, what should I say? I was 20, you know, I go, what should I say? He said, oh, just say, why aren't you ever funny? <laughs> I know you <laughs> I never forgot. That. I know you, uh, wait, did Robin Williams attend the college or did he just show up? No, he just showed up to perform at that. And then afterward, we did it. And I was talking. He goes, hey, he goes, hey, do you know are there any improv classes here? So I said, yeah, across the, go across the, the camp, across the street. There's a class going on right now. And um, and then my room, other roommate from uh, one of them, Tony Vrab, great guy. He goes, John, uh, that guy came in the class. I was doing improv with him. This was like nine months before Mark and Mindy. And um, and the teach, and then when Mark and Mindy came out, we go, oh, that's the guy, you know, at college. And then the, I remember uh, Tony said, our, my teacher said to him, who is this guy? Because of course he was amazing, you know. But it was about, that was like in May. And then that September, Mark and Mindy hit, you know. You know, it's interesting. I kind of like to sometimes think about stuff you, you hope for, for your kids. And, uh, how they have a lot of range because that's the guy could either be <laughs> Robin Williams or could be the serial killer. Mm -hmm. That guy lived in the apartment next to mine. Yep. Like when he's on the news, yeah. you go, I that's that, that guy, guy. <laughs> or that's that guy. It's never the middle. It's either going to be extremely like, would you wish that for your kids? That's that guy. You're you're rolling the 50 dice. 50. Yeah. Much more chance it's going to be the killer or <laughs> someone who did something bad. <laughs> Uh, I know you recently defended uh, Whoopi and uh, Joe Rogan on Twitter, so I'd like to get your thoughts on the thought police okay. out there as far as uh, comedians go. Oh, is it, oh, I thought you were going to go. We're going to commercial when we come back. Oh, that sounds like a tease, but no. No, yeah. Um, you know, for me, it's different when you, you know, because I've known these people forever. You know, I, I met Whoopi in 1985, so I know her. She's a great person. So, and then I remember years ago asking her, how did how did she come up with her name, Whoopi Goldberg? This was like, an, I think it was a set of Rat Race, the, the movie we did like in 2002 or something. One, so she said, her real name's Karen Johnson, right? So I said, how did you come up with Whoopi Goldberg? It's so funny. She goes, well, actually, it's real. I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, I was going to be Whoopi Cushion. <laughs> I thought it'd be funny. And then my mom said, well, if you're going to do that, why don't you do something funnier? But it's real Goldberg. She goes, what do you mean? She goes, we have relatives, the Goldbergs. We're part Jewish. I go, you're, and I said, you're part Jewish? She goes, yeah. She goes, I, John, I have family reunions. And there's black people there, Chinese and Jewish and, and, and there's a res family resemblance between all of them. Hmm. And, and I never forgot that. So, and also I know her and she's friends with Billy Crystal and she's not anti-Semitic. So I didn't think what she said was, I didn't think what she said was anti-Semitic 
at all. I just thought that's the way she looked at it. Because in her mind, she's, you know, a black woman in America, race is you're black or you're white. Now, how could she not know that the Nazis said we're the master race? You know, I don't know. But the other part of it is, you know, she's she's also, you know, Tiff, there's people. In, I didn't know this till I was much older. There's there's Jews in every country in the world. You know, Japan, China, there's a, 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 an Ethiopia. They're called mm-hmm. Falasha Jews. They're black Jews, which is a, a Tiffany Haddish, the comedian. Her She's Jewish. She's a Falasha Jew. Her father's from Ethiopia. So you have to know all this. And then secondly, if you look at what happened in Germany, the Jews during that time, they go, they consider themselves Germans. They go, we're Germans first, you know, and they would have fought for the country. And it was Adolf Hitler, the, you know, ultimate asshole of life that said, no, they're a race, right? It's a religion. You can't, you can convert to Judaism. You can't convert to a race. Although these days you can, I True. guess you mm. can get, identify as Chinese and they go, well, John, but you're not Chinese. Well, I just said I was. Okay, I guess you are. I do a joke. I go, I identify as a Chinese woman named Madame Wu. <laughs> <laughs> and my therapist said, well, how are you today, Madam Wu? I said, frankly, my balls itch. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, the, I look at it, it's ridiculous. So, so, um, so I would say to her, at the very least, she's misinformed. But she she said that the next day she goes, hey, I was misinformed. I'm looking at it as like black and white and I was wrong. It's man's inhumanity to man and it's race. I go, right. And, but also, if you look at it this way, like, I remember years ago, you know, when they had um, Ireland, they had North and South Ireland. And and I remember thinking the Protestants and the Catholics. And I remember saying then I go, I don't get it. I mean. They're all Irish. Like, what are they doing? You know, well, I didn't totally understand the situation. It wasn't just about that. But I think that's kind of how she looked at it. Like, they're all like, what racism? They're all white. You know what I mean? Yeah. And she apologized the next day. And she's a good person. And she's not malicious. And she was just saying what she believed. And yeah, as part of me would think it's unfathomable that she would not know about the Nazis said they're the master race and you got to have blonde hair and blue eyes and everyone else doesn't count. But that's how she was thinking about it. And then as far as, so, you know, and I know her. So she said, Hey, I made a mistake. So I don't, to me, it's not that big a deal. And then Joe Rogan is, I met him when I did news radio years ago. And I remember then thinking this guy's like a genius. He's really smart. It's his show. And he says a lot of things that um, I think are really smart. And then he says a lot of things that I don't agree with. But my answer to that is, so what? If you, if I don't like the show or I don't listen to it all the time, but, I, you know, don't change the channel. Like, don't listen to it. And um, I just said, you know, why are you going to take medical advice from Joe Rogan? <laughs> He's not a doctor. My whole family's doctors, you know. But one thing Joe said about the, I mean, the the pandemic, which I thought was the smartest thing I heard, which was, he said, well, what about, you know, building up your immune system and working out and taking vitamins and trying to stay healthy like that? And I thought, yeah, that's very smart. And that's called preventive medicine, you know. And my father was a doctor and internist. My father's brother, my mom's brother is a world famous eye doctor. We get it. You're Jewish. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, I go, I'm the village idiot that makes more money than all of them put together. <laughs> you know, I couldn't be a doctor. I'm an idiot. But I just, when people say doctors don't know anything, I'm like, well, you're a moron. I go, really? That's all they've been doing. I go, when you, okay, why don't you have your plumber do your brain surgery, you know? Well, I, I think, I, I, I mean, part of me likes it because I feel like it means we're out of problems that we have to just nitpick everyone's statements. You know, there's a couple things. If you're going to talk for a living and you're not a, a an actor, there's no script, you're just going to bloviate for hours a day. You know, uh-huh. Whoopi Goldberg, Joe Rogan, whomever, whoever, just the, the talkers, the Our people sir. that, yeah, the people that just talk for a living. Right. 
Well, it's 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 not possible that you don't get certain things wrong. Sure. Or that there's an opinion that you're off on because you you literally just talk extemporaneously all day, every day. So mm-hmm. first things first. Right. Let's uh, give them a, cut people a little slack. When you sit down and you write a book called uh, Hitler Didn't Think the Jews Were a Race, well, then that means you sat down, you wrote it, it was edited, and blah, blah, blah. Racers. But when you're just talking, and, yeah. spe- and not only talking about something you thought you're going to talk about, but so all the different directions a conversation can go where you're talking about removing books from a classroom one second and three seconds later you're talking about the Holocaust and you got to shift and pivot. Well, then let's uh, show those people a little bit of grace because there's no possible way, you know, like we do a lot of, this is what she thinks. It's like, well, I don't know because it's what she's thinking in real time. It doesn't, or he's thinking yeah. in real time. It doesn't mean they've sat down and explored these thoughts. But also what she said right. was not wrong. It is also man's inhumanity to man. War is right. man's inhumanity to man. Right. So we're a little too, uh, you, you know, I, there's too much of a jeweler's loop and a fine tooth comb that we're doing with conversations. People have conversations they're wide ranging, they have opinions, and not everyone is an expert in every field. And then also, I think it's a flawed notion to say that people watch The View or listen to Joe Rogan and they get all their mar- marching orders. I think, uh, I think people yeah. listen and they hear things they agree with and then they hear other things they disagree with and they don't play as fast and loose with they don't play as fast and loose with their health as we think they do. Like it was all, you know, Trump said to inject bleach. You know what I mean? Okay, who injected bleach? No, I mean people don't. People don't do that. They go, okay, that guy said what? And then they go, let me go on WebMD here, or let me Google this, or I'll ask my physician. I, it's it's way too naive to think that everybody is that naive that they just take their marching orders from some whack job. And then, and then they go, because it's like, there's always flat earthers, but there's not a lot of them. And then there's KKK members, but there's not a lot of them. Like they're, everything exists, but there's not, you know, they're people who drink their own urine because they think it's healthy, but there's not a lot of them. That's wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're saying that isn't healthy? There's just love. He's it. not a doctor. Don't listen to oh, him. Oh, no. I'm just saying. Drink away. A lot of people believe in the no, devil Adam, and the like rapture. Your, your, and... Show, your show, you have a lot of opinions. And some stuff you say, a lot of stuff I agree. And then some stuff I don't. But my answer is, so what? Right. Well, let's. So what I don't agree. I still want to hear what you have to say because yeah. I, I like talking to people that have different differing viewpoints for me because I'll learn something. I don't know everything, you know, and, and then sometimes they say, they'll listen to me and I go, Oh, I didn't know that I was wrong. I thought it was this. No, it's this. Okay. This doesn't mean you're should be canceled and you're a bad person and lose your job. Well, it's moronic. Also then let's just reverse engineer this. Joe Rogan invites guests on his show who say the exact same thing you've seen on CNN for nine months. Is that a compelling podcast? You know what I mean? I mean, I think what he does, and a lot of people do, is they go, let's see if we can find a counter voice mm-hmm. to what we all look. We all get the narrative. Everyone knows of distancing and masking and vaccine and the kids are our future and all, all the stuff. All right. We got all that. Now, let's hear something from the other side. Let's hear something that may compete with that. And then we get both. And then we get to decide which idea we think will win the day. The notion of whether it's Joe or Whoopi Goldberg or whomever, you just want to hear more of what you've already heard. That doesn't feel compelling to me. Um, No. And then the show like The View, I thought about it because, you know, like I go, well, of course, why didn't I realize? Of course, every topic, they're going to have different points of view, just what you said, so that they're like an arguing, well, I think it's this, well, I think you're wrong. Otherwise, everyone goes, 
they said this, you think I'll agree. Yes. Okay. That we're done with talking about that next topic. You know, so a lot of times they do, they, you know, they That's, take it, opposite points of view it's to, to the, make an interesting show. It's the bedrock of every sports show. <laughs> That's what they do. Point yes. counterpoint. Everyone must be the best or the worst of all time. Right. That's the way they roll. All right, John, you want to hang with us and do some news? Sure. All right. Let me just hit uh, 1-800-Flowers. Attention, last-minute Valentine's Day shoppers. This is a reminder brought to you by 1-800-Flowers.com. Valentine's is uh, here. And uh, let's not be the guy who wakes up in terror because uh, you forgot Amazon. Oh, I should say amazing offers for my listeners. 24 assorted roses for just $39.99. Or you can upgrade to 24 red roses for just 10 bucks more. When I was poor, a dozen roses was like 130 bucks. Such a deal now. All the roses from 1-800-Flowers are picked at their peak, cared for every step, and shipped fresh for lasting beauty. Bouquets are selling fast. Delivery dates are limited. Lock in your order for Valentine's Day. You want to lock in that Valentine's delivery date? You want to do it at 1-800-Flowers.com. That's 1-800-Flowers.com. Right, Dawson? To order 24 assorted roses for three... A little bit. To order 24 assorted roses for $39.99 or upgraded 24 red roses for only $10 more, go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Click the radio icon and enter code ACS. That's one 800 that's 1-800-Flowers.com, code ACS. Hurry, offer expires Wednesday. You know, it's funny. Something popped in my head apropos of nothing. Mm-hmm. But um, I was, uh, uh, Dennis Quaid, who I was up on stage with the other night, was, I was saying, do you get a lot of confusion or people know you because you've been in 200 movies? And it's like, <laughs> he goes, I get a lot of Patrick Swayze. And I'm like, really? Back in the day? He goes, oh, no, now. Wow. Wait, like, How? That's I, I got I got Norm, I got Norm McDonald the other day. Look, when somebody dies, you, you gotta can let it go. A lot of your memory. You can you can confuse Dennis Quaid for Patrick Swayze, but not six years after Swayze's yeah. died. Wow. You gotta let that yeah. one go or find look, someone new pivot. I would ask this. Do you know Patrick Swayze or don't you? Because you know enough. <laughs> To think Dennis Quaid is Patrick Swayze, but not enough to know the man died six and a half years ago. It's a weird relationship. I get the don't know Patrick Swayze, but then don't ask if Dennis is Patrick Swayze. (laughs) It's insulting, especially if you think. Uh, I was was, uh, people come up to me and they go, are you, uh, you know, I I don't if someone knows who I am, I'm more flat. If they don't know who I am, I'm not insulted. I'm like, if you you know, I'm I'm like, I don't care. You know, nobody. If you know who I am, it's flattering, you know, whatever. But if people come up, they go, are you who I think you are? I go, yeah. They go, well, what's your name again? So for 30 years now, I go, Ed Begley Jr. <laughs> <laughs> they thought, who's more opposite? And then I actually met Ed years ago, and I told him, I just, I'll start saying I'm you. You know, it happened. And then went to, the funniest was I was in Hawaii. Some woman at a bar, at a restaurant, she was saying, are you who I think you are? So I go, I'm just going to go for a I go, yes. She goes, I go, I, I guess. She goes, what's your name again? I go, Clark Gable. Yes, yes. Clark Gable. I know. I, 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 and my, my feeling is everybody sort out your thoughts before you approach the person. Yeah, don't say the first thing that comes to mind. Don't walk to the table and then start the guessing game. <laughs> Sit with it for a second. Get your ducks in line. My greatest, I don't know why this always sticks out to me, but... I had the two dudes and the one dude was like, I know this dude. And then we started to walk down memory lane. He goes, uh, you know, did you grow up in Oregon? I'm like, no. Mm. Did you play little league baseball? No. Did you go to Louis Pasteur middle? (laughs) No. And then his friend started saying he's on TV. He's Mm -hmm. on TV. He, He didn't grow up with him. He's on TV. That's how you know him. And he's like, dude, shut up. Did you ever have a Mr. Bacchus for chemistry? Like we had, and a friend would just keep yelling at him. You don't know him. You know him from TV. And he kept telling his friend to shut up because he was sure that grown somehow we'd grown up together. All right, we'll take a quick break. Come back to the news with John Lovitz right after this.
We talked a little bit already about the low ratings with the Olympics and all the things they're dealing with. Also, U.S. isn't exactly crushing it yet, yet, going days into the games without uh, winning a gold medal. Uh, But to make matters worse, athletes are complaining about what happens if you do wind up in COVID quarantine over there. And... Polish speed skater Natalia Mezluska says her heart can't take it. Russian biathlete Valeria Vastanotsva uh, complained about being gaunt and pale, says she cries every day. Um, they're in isolation, uh, incoherent testing protocols, and the food is flat out awful, they said. We have a picture of it. Some uh, unidentified meat, some just plain <laughs> pasta, an orange sauce, and this is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm <laughs> sorry, but... First off, a couple things. Don't they have to know that this is just a bad look? Like, I thought the Nobody whole... Nobody ever cared. Sochi, they were sleeping on cardboard beds. All right, a couple things. Um, crying alone. <laughs> do people really do that? Yes. They do. They <laughs> they sit. I, mean, I, I get, like, seeing, you know, seeing, a, you know, seeing Old Yeller yeah. or Brian's song. Or hearing some bad news about an uncle that passed away and didn't leave you anything. But when people do that thing where they go, I cried every day. I would sit on my bed and I would weep open. I'm like, really? Well, do you think they need to gather an audience first? I'm like, I feel like, you know, you get motivated to cry. Mm -hmm. Something's upsetting. Well, you're basically in jail. Yeah, but at a certain point. At the point, most exciting. All you're doing is dehydrating your face. That's true. At a certain you point. Need that. And I just, and also, I, I feel like a speed skater would have a little more intestinal fortitude. You know, mm. that's a tough, mm-hmm. that's a tough gig. So speed that should skater, show you how bad the skater. conditions are. Yeah. But all right. She sits and cries. Well, I'm glad they said that because coincidentally, the food has gotten much better since this tweet went out. Now they're getting some salmon and some fresh vegetables and stuff. But, it, it's a it's a tough and and actually Brian you might have watched a doc on this you think why do we keep we why do mm. they keep picking these countries and it sounds oh, it was like a it real is, sport it, was it yeah it is yeah. such sketchy yeah. under the table shit probably the most corrupt organization in all of sports yeah professional the team. IOC yeah anything that where there's buku box and it's international always turns into a shit show. Yeah, this is, it's, you know, it's happening again it, to an extent. Um, but I also, we talked about this a while ago and I hadn't brought it back up because we really didn't have any new information. Well, unfortunately we do. Remember when we talked about Chinese tennis star Peng Shui? Mm-hmm. Shui? She had made this, uh, let me just backtrack. Okay. She basically went on Twitter and accused the um, former vice uh, premier of sexual Abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, that tweet was deleted. She disappeared she for was weeks. Yes, nobody could find her. Nobody knew where she was. Um, she has reemerged. Um, she's taken it all back. She <laughs> said it never happened, and um, she is also she announced her retirement from the sport. Mm. So um, she she disappeared for a while. She's 36, and a French newspaper just interviewed her, and this is her first time announcing that she was wrong. It, it never happened to a Western publication like a French newspaper, and she's retracted all of her earlier comments, and all of the um, statements she's made have all been um, prepared and read. Well, then, here's my whole thing about the... You know, I said this guy raped me, but eh, I had some chance. I had a chance to think about it, and uh, it never happened. My feeling is like, oh, well, we're not done with you. You now accuse this guy of rape, so we got to punish you, which might get you to change your story back again. I get that, but I'm I'm seeing this from a different angle. Hmm. Like, oh, well, she was coerced. Thank you. Obviously, okay. I'm just saying it is interesting that we go. All right, well now. He didn't rape her, and we can we can we move, all move on, on with our lives. Yeah, yeah, we get it. China bad. Don't get why. Uh, it's such a oh god. Well, by the way, the um, yeah, the I was going to say, but early it was the food thing. If it, I don't understand, like they're in China, so when you be like, put the food. Sorry to go back. Just say hey, um, just, just go out and like go to a Panda Express. <laughs> Oh, they got to That's where that chain that they mm. started their first franchise in China. Yeah, I, I Chinese food. 
I uh, I don't know. If I I always hear super authentic Chinese food is not our version. Our sort of corn syrupy version. Let of me Chinese ask you a question: food. Have you ever gone with your Asian friends to dim sum in Alhambra on a weekend or Monterey Park? Many times. Okay, <laughs> so you know it's not Panda Express. <laughs> I've had chicken feet. I've had. All kinds of things that, that you wouldn't normally get at a Chinese restaurant. Mm, interesting. Oh, and why wouldn't they give... If, okay, here's something interesting. I wonder if they're removing some of the competition for some of the Chinese athletes. Like you just take the fastest speed skater and just go, <laughs> oh, you're running a temperature, sweetie. Interesting. We got to quarantine you. Very interesting. Ugh, it's all... It's all a mess. John, I can tell you a quick story. A friend of mine's a famous artist. And I said, do you think China's corrupt? He goes, what are you kidding? He wanted to donate a statue to China and they wanted for free for a park. And they said, okay, it's going to, you have to pay us like $300,000. Wow. He goes, no, no, I'm giving it to you for free. And then one time he made a deal where he's going to sell his art in China and the, and he said to his lawyer, did you read the deal you made? He goes, I don't make any money. They get they get 80% and then they get they get the 100% of all the money. Yeah. Sold. And he and so the guy the guy from China, he goes, I'm not signing this deal. I don't make any money. He goes, fuck you. And the guy goes, you're a very smart man. Oh, wow. And he just left the room. Brian, did you have a question? John gave me an idea, which then had a second idea, which nullified it. But my first thought was, what is the... American version of P.F. Chang's or, or Panda Express that exists in other countries? Like, what's their bastardized McDonald's. idea? What's I, their bastardized idea of American food? Then I realized, oh, American companies like Taco Bell and McDonald's no. are so ubiquitous. That is our export. That is just American food. But I can answer that more specifically. Oh, please, yeah. I, is it Japan? Japan or China? I think it's Japan. KFC is insanely popular and it is on back order for christmas like your christmas really? dinner yes so kfc i think would be our major export so yeah i don't know if we have a panda express ver- bastardized version that exists i think it's just the kfc's of the world and the mcdonald's mm-hmm. is, but you do know. get some crazy ass options at that's mcdonald's true. around the world oh really oh yeah it's oh, not you what you're squid ink on your fries yeah, yeah like yeah. there's like curry patties specific. or yeah croquettes or hummus depends yeah. where you go a yeah, beer in europe yeah. Spaghetti sauce. We're not going to rest until everyone is fat. Correct. Like we're, you know, <laughs> we have mission. we have childhood mor- morbid obesity over here, <clears throat> but we're going to export it to Japan and China and Europe. Yeah. Like we're we're going to. It's kind of a decent strategy because in case a war breaks breaks out, everyone's going to be uh, equally unable to run up the hill and wind in sucking off an inhaler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, smart. Yeah. We're, we're crazy like a fox. <laughs> well, I know we already touched on this, and, but I'll just give you a couple of couple of beats that we hadn't talked about. Uh, so, Joe Rogan, we get it. But there is a new company, or at least new to me and probably a lot of other people, called Rumble. That is, I guess, more of a platform for right-wing hosts. Um, they have Dan Bongino, Dinesh D'Souza, Steve Bannon. And they formally invited... Um, Joe Rogan on a tweet saying, we'll give you $100 million if you just want to drop Spotify and come over here. And oh. they said, this is a totally legit offer. You know, there's a couple of things, and I, I say it all the time, because I was just seeing, so it was uh, GoFundMe, somebody started a GoFundMe page to uh, support the Canadian truckers, mm-hmm. and they got to like $8 bucks, and then GoFundMe said, we're not going to give the money to the truckers. First, they said something really stupid, which is, we're just going to give it to our own charities, like That's Black illegal. Lives Matter and stuff. That. And everyone went, you can't, look, you can, give it, you can give it funds. back to people who yeah. gave it to you. So they go, okay, uh, we're not going to give the money to the truckers, Go, so says GoFundMe. Now come some, and I'll screw up the name, but come get some, the Christian uh-huh. crowd raising. They come in, and now they've raised five million bucks on the conservative Christian, uh-huh. whatever. And here's what I'm saying. All this stuff, whether it's, you know, cancel this and cancel that, all, you know, or, you know, pull this guy off the internet or or, or shut, shut his Twitter down, all you're doing, or, uh, you know, a uh, boycott Chick Fil A. Mm-hmm. You're just creating a, a, other platforms and longer lines and other businesses. You're just the best thing, you know. So it's like 
GoFundMe, okay, they're progressive. Fine. Uh, so as a progressive platform, you'd sure hate to have the conservative Christian platform get any traction, right. but you just gave them traction right. because you announced that you're shutting down. You're not going to give yeah. the money to truckers. And then this pops up. You created a cause. Right. You're, cre you're creating all these alternative platforms and places and podcasts right. and stuff because you're trying to shut everyone the fuck down. It's going to back. It, it, well, the same thing with Rogan. You know, Rogan's got, you know, um, Neil Young. You just gave Rogan $75 million worth of mm -hmm. advertising in the last nine days. Right. Like, that's, you're creating this. Yeah. I don't get, I don't get why they don't get the strategy of that. You're absolutely right. There's a, a meme that that reminds me of, and I'm not, I'm not comparing one to the other, but you'll get why I'm bringing it up. Um, there's a meme that basically when you're talking about, you know, your allies are like a well-meaning person and you tell them to go fuck themselves. The meme is that's how super villains are made. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, get along. And, oh, the Incredibles. Right. Mm -hmm. So, We're yeah, funny. it's like it, people don't just go away because you wish them to go away. They'll they'll pop up somewhere else and they'll also hate you for it. Yes. So, so to me, yeah. the other problem is like they go, you can't have the KKK and the Nazis on Twitter and 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 saying what they're talking and meeting. And my point of view is, of course, they're horrible, but you don't want them to go underground these, they're idiots. You want them to be on the Twitter this and saying everything so you can see where they are and you yeah. know where they are and what they're going to do. Let them expose they go themselves. Ground, now you got to spend way more money and, and time and effort to find out what when they're going to blow up a building or kill someone. You know what I mean? I, it's like, listen, it's it's like the mob. If they want to write checks and there's a paper trail, <laughs> let them do it. But we're forcing them to work, pay all in cash. <laughs> and now we can't we can't trace it. Yeah. You know, I agree with John. Let them. Let's have the paper trail. Yeah. Um, so this story's eh, maybe five, six days old, but I've been meaning to get to it. And I really wanted because I, I, we hadn't talked about it. I didn't know if you knew about it. In Koreatown here in Los Angeles, there have been these mysterious boulders that mm -hmm. have been showing up on the sidewalks. Oh, yeah. I saw this. And I think we have the picture. I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure if I resent it today. But there, there's these really big mystery boulders that showed up where an encampment used to be. And oh, it, I have now you're putting it together. Right. So, yeah, exactly. So um, the neighborhood's all for it. Somebody saw some truck in the middle of the night start placing them. The neighbors in the neighborhood in, in Koreatown is asking the government here to please leave them there and of course they won't they said they're going to come pick them up but this well, is the speed with which they actually clean out that's the true it's take like forever well this isn't the first time this has happened because apparently in 2020 residents lined a uh, south robertson underpass with boulders and the city made them remove those too but again the people in the neighborhood are like please we don't know who did it, but just leave them where they are. I think the South Robertson overpass, if I'm imagining it correctly, is the 10 freeway, and mm. that's right next to a school. Mm. So you can see how that would be problematic. Like it's like it's like a middle school there. The boulders are the homeless, though. <laughs> no, which no, is the problem. homeless. The oh, yeah. The, the, uh, well, until some students. The kids can walk around the boulders. <laughs> some students from the uh, University of Wisconsin come by and declare the boulders oh, racist, yeah. Can't do that. which uh, is a story from six months ago. Uh, so those boulders are in front of the locked fence. It looks like they're trying to block people going into that fence. They're trying to block the encampment. But look, here's Private. here's essentially what the boulders are, as best I can tell. They are when people put those steel bumps on the side yes. of the bench or the curb or the rail yep. going down because yep. they don't want skateboarders out grinding. doing <laughs> grinding on it. This is essentially what the what the boulders yep. are. But also, listen, how long would you live in a place where there were homeless encampments nearby, next door, in front of your house? Or like at some point where you just went, I must go out and take the law into my own hands, oh. essentially. I can't if the city is not going to do anything about this and it's been four years, yep. at some point we're just gonna have to do something. They're not doing anything. You're right. And this isn't just here. Um, I came across this sign that a friend sent to me. This is from, I believe, Ontario. It's definitely Canada. And there are signs that say, I support my neighbors in tents, no encampment evictions. Right. Now that's not from here, but these are real yeah, signs. They misspelled neighbors. neighbors. Yeah. Oh they? yeah, neighbors. The uh who's done less for what group? 
Uh, the homeless advocates for the homeless or Al Sharpton for the black community? Who, which one of these fucking grifters has done less for the people they somehow represent? And by the way, you're a homeless advocate. You're 51. When did you become an expert in homelessness, considering this thing is five years old? And how did you become? I don't, I'm tired of all the self-anointed, <laughs> right. I speak for, I'm an advocate. And by the way, advo- you, your advocacy is basically, let them OD on fentanyl on the street. Yes. You're an advocate? I- what, what, what if you're, okay, uh, Bob Barker. He loves dogs. <laughs> He 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 wants yeah. to help dogs. He's an advocate for dogs. Yeah. Would he go let the dog OD yeah. on the street in its own filth, or Snip would him. he go let's do something yeah. for these no dogs? No, you're right, and I've been saying that for so long. And Dr. Drew used to say it until you know they kicked him off the board or whatever. Mm-hmm. But saying you support an encampment in 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 my experience and what I see in LA, that is not humane. I see, I walk every day. I see the way these people are living under the 101. It's not a humane way to live. Why would you, why would that be the best way to help that person? Yeah, but you know, the face of homelessness is not just the person with mental illness or the drug addicted junkie, but the mother of three who was literally laid off at the book bindery and now has to... <laughs> It's like, you're going to explain to us what the face of homelessness is? Let me just explain something. If you've never seen it, if you've never seen it, then it doesn't exist. This this thing is like, have you ever passed a group of homeless people and seen a sober, proud mother of three going, let's go to the river and bathe? Mm. No, it doesn't happen because that woman, she lands on a sofa. Somewhere. She has family. All these people. Look, it, it's all it's all drugs and mental illness because they've worn out all their safety nets. There is no moving back home. There's no living in our friend's guest house. There's a, It's all gone because the last time they did it, they stole a bunch of. They burned that bridge. They burned all the bridges are burned. And when you're the mother of three, you still have a bunch of bridges intact. You get right. to go somewhere. <clears throat> you have friends. You have, you have relationships. You, right. have, you can go. You can. You can. You can. You can couch surf. And and that's and by exactly. The way, it should be sofa surf. It's yeah. got the, the right there. S right, right there. there. The alliteration. Right. Yeah. And we've talked about that too. Mental illness and mental health is like really sexy right now. We're allowed to talk yeah, about it. We crow about it. By all means, help people with mental illness or addiction. Excuse me. I'm sorry. How is it sexy? Uh-huh. Yeah, I hate, I know, that word is the worst. It's like, Brian. You walk by a home, people right. go, mm. I, I do. Me no, but it's a it's an in topic. It's a trendy it's topic. It's eye. quote unquote yeah. sexy. It's 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 encouraged. So yeah. why aren't we encouraging it for the people who clearly need it? Need it a lot. I, I have, I have, look, it's, if you talk to anybody who isn't remotely familiar with that population and you go, how many of these people are either on drugs or mentally ill or both? They go 100%. Because the ones that aren't go get the free the housing. They, yeah. they avail themselves mm-hmm. of the services. If, if you want, I'm, I'm homeless <laughs> because I physically can't pay rent. And then someone goes, well, you can go to a shelter and eat some spaghetti. It's, it's going to be put on your tray with an ice cream scooper, but it's still spaghetti. Something. And then you go, it's oh, I'm do- sober and I'm sane? Okay, I'll go over there. It's better than the Olympic athletes get. Right. Uh, or would you rather just sleep on the sidewalk? No, I would not. So it's a group, which is there are facilities, there are programs, there's our, there are outreach and blah, blah, blah. If you do not want to be involved with any of that... It means you don't want to stop doing drugs, which I understand, but that's what it means. So de facto, everyone you pass who's living in a cardboard box is on drugs and or insane or both. There is that that this def- definition of the new phase or calling them, you know, currently unhoused or whatever. It's all it, it, it's it, it is no solution. There is no there's no path to progress or solution, look no further than no path. 
that we've never done it. We don't do it. Why is it getting then why is it worse every year if whatever if you're doing something? But again, mark my words, when that Summer Olympics comes around in L.A., it'll suddenly, yeah. the course will correct itself. They'll all be gone. We won't know where they are, yeah. but they'll be gone. Yes. Sparkle. That's and right. And by the way, eventually, people, you know, if you think about, you know, the bad guys. Now, a couple things. First off, if you're going to live on the street, you're going to need a weapon of some kind at some point to protect well, yourself, yeah. you know? It's reality. Uh, so now you're going to have a bunch of people that are very impaired mentally and from a from a uh, substance standpoint who are carrying a machete. Mm-hmm. You're going to get, get a fair bit of that going on. But also, as I learned from uh, my encounter at the Staples Center uh, some years ago when I left the what was then the Staples Center, and I walked outside and I saw all of the folks on the on the land, on the sidewalk, not sidewalk, on, on the Staples Center land, like selling the that street dogs and the beers and everything. And later on, a short period of time, I, w- I went on a, a, a boat ride with the guy who runs, who runs the Staples Center. And he's like, I'm like, God, we have all this going on. It's a, he walked outside. I almost tripped over a guy with a propane cart. He famously pulled out his phone and showed me a picture of a giant cockroach on a grill that someone mm. said. Um, so I said, so two things. I said to him, uh, well, let's get rid of these people. This is your land. You know, there's and he's like, go talk to the uh, city council. He said, I don't want to get into trouble. He didn't mm. want to get into trouble. The guy who runs the Staples Center was scared of the repercussions of telling the city council to clear off his land with all these people that were just selling food unregulated. But the other thing he said was, he goes, uh, you know, at the beginning, this was just sort of earnest, poor people, illegals, you know, cooking. And right. he said, that's not how it works anymore. Mm-hmm. They all meet in like Chatsworth. There's a guy in a van, gets them all loaded up. It's all women and children because somehow that's more palatable or they don't like mm-hmm. the optics of taking the mom. And they come and they drive out and they drop them all off. Then they have them mm-hmm. cook. Then they collect their money. How long before shit gets organized? You know what I mean? Before the right. bad guys get in. Of course. And when you start hearing about... Uh, the trains being robbed and stuff. You start going, who who are these people? Well, the drug cartels are organizing these people and telling them, of course, they're going to get involved at some point. You have this small army of criminals that are just hanging out. Why not get them under one tent? You know, why not unionize? You can only sell so many avocados. Right. Mm. Right. So we're going to get into that with the homelessness, yeah. too. Awesome. That is, I, I can't believe there's another layer of exploitation mm-hmm. in that hot dog story. Mm-hmm. That Those women probably aren't even, that's not, they're not keeping that money. Well, how long is a runaway going to be a prostitute before a pimp sidles up to her Touché. and turns her yeah. out? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. On. Can we please? Oh, I give up. Yeah. How long? <laughs> 19 <laughs> months, John. You know from experience. 19 months, four days, and 11 hours. <laughs> Well, I'd love to end on a little um, a little award show talk. I know that Brian did the Oscars. That's cute. We appreciate it. Some well, people care. Yeah, let's talk about the award show that really gets all the buzz, the Razzies. Um, they always are around at this time. Bruce Willis, LeBron James, and Amy Adams are among the nominees for the 42nd Annual Razzie Awards, which honors Hollywood's worst films of 2021, at least for this year. The year's biggest stinkers, according to them, uh, in the worst picture category are Diana the Musical. That's the Netflix one, not the Spencer with Kristen Stewart. Um, mm. Infinite, which I've never heard of. I Karen, which I think was with... Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know who was in it. It was about, it was from about Orange Orange Orange. a very quickie movie. Yes, uh, Space Jam, A New Legacy, How Dare You, Big in Our House. And The Woman in the Window, not the same as The Woman in the House across the street from The Girl in the Window. Different movie. Uh, actors receiving nods from their uh, performances include Scott Eastwood, LeBron James, Mar- Mark Wahlberg, Amy Adams, Megan Fox, and Ruby Rose. But one actor will absolutely win. 
that is Bruce Willis because he received all the nominations in a category specifically for him. It's called Worst Performance by Bruce Willis in a 2021 movie. It includes all eight movies the actor made in 2021. Seven he's, were direct he, to video. He's quietly churning out Nicolas uh, Cage level movies. I had no movies? idea. Eight. And seven of them were direct to video. I, I didn't even know. He's making the international market. He's, he's got bills to pay. Yeah. Wow. It sounds like that category is rigged. Yeah, it does. It really does. You got to show up, right, to show that you got a sense of humor? Yeah, the best yeah. example is Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock, yeah. right? Yeah, there, we're at the point where you, you got to lean into it, it Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's like reading mean tweets. Yeah. All right, let's bring it home, Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Why aren't you ever funny? <laughs> Gina, Gina Grad! That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, the great John Lovitz. You can shoot him a tweet at Real John Lovitz. Instagram at John underscore Lovitz as well. You can go to AdamCarolla.com for all the live shows that are coming up. And we got a bunch of live shows coming up in Spokane and Tacoma, Waukegan, Illinois, and Kansas City. So just go there and find out when we're coming to a town near you. Thanks for joining us, John. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Bye. Until next time, it's Adam Corolla, Regina Grant, Bull Bryan, and John Lovett saying mahalo. Let him OD on fentanyl on the street. Yes. You're an advocate? <laughs> what if you're... Okay. Uh, Bob Barker. He loves dogs. <laughs> he, I, he's... He, he wants no. to help dogs. He's an advocate for dogs. No. When you go, let the dog OD no. on the street in its own filth, or Snip when up. you go, let's do something yeah. for these dogs.